Hello and welcome. My name is Madeline Schmoll and I'm your host for tonight. Welcome to our June virtual tasting. This month, we've been shaking things up, diving into how you can experience whiskey differently in cocktails. So tonight's whiskies are all about showcasing the humble bourbon barrel. We'll talk a bit more about this in just a minute. Um, if you're wanting to purchase any whiskies tonight, four of the five bottlings are available via the secret shopping link, which is smws.com forward slash VMT dash shopping. This includes all of the bottlings from tonight, aside from 10.204 Pineapples Ahoy, which was part of our April outturn and is now sold out. For those of you tuning in from the EU, we've kept bottlings aside for your to be rescheduled June tasting. So I'm just gonna take you through the running order for tonight's festivities now. We'll start with cask 39.209 Apple Aperitif, followed by 73.121 Mimo's Moon Pie. Next up, it's 36.164 Bittersweet uh, Christmas Stocking Treat, uh, followed by 35.269 Banana Balaclava, and then it's 10.204 Pineapples Ahoy. So this is the point to make sure you have your tasting mat ready. If you've chosen any of the food pairings from tonight, let us know. Um, and uh, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to comment and we can take it from there. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to your ambassadors for the evening. First up, we have Andrew Park. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? We all well? How are you doing, Andrew? You doing well? I'm multitasking tonight. Normally, I am, normally I'm hiding behind the screen, squirreling away, getting all your questions in. Uh, and today, because we've got some of our ambassadors actually finally out in the field conducting tastings, I thought I would step in and, you know, say hello to everyone first and foremost. So welcome, everyone. So you're pushing the buttons and you're doing the presenting. Yeah, so if you see any serious face going on, that's me trying to learn how to type. Uh, after okay. five drams, okay. it's not going to be easy, but I'll I'll do my professional best. Noted, noted. I'll step in if required. It's a hard job, but I'll, I'm happy to help, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, our other host for the evening is Ambassador Andrew Reid, who some of you may recognise from the vaults. How are you doing, Andrew? Good evening. Very well. Doing what we do best. No, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for having us along. Great. Good to have Good you. Good to have you, buddy. How's things at the vaults tonight? Is it busy? Uh, it's always busy at the vaults. Uh, we've got another tasting in the other room, but um, I've hijacked the aptly named tasting room, as some of you may recognise. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's just the perfect setting for a tasting like, such as this. But, yeah, no, it, something happening in every single room today. So, kept busy, on our toes. <laughs> Good stuff. Lovely stuff. Well, well, I'm going to take a few of the comments and then I think we'll kick off into our first dram. So we've got a lot of hellos. We've got Peter Murray. It's his first virtual tasting. Welcome, Peter. Um, we've got Ian, who's in a very wet Dunbar. Uh, it, it is quite wet out tonight. It's a good. I think it's a good night for drinking whiskey. Um, we've got Darren, who's looking forward to tasting. We've got Anne Bingham and Saparno Ray. Um, yeah. So I think we should... Lots of familiar uh, faces. So yeah, welcome back oh. everyone that's joined us before. And welcome to all the newbies that are in as well. So great to have you on this Thursday night. Fab. Well, I think uh, you're up first actually, Andrew, with uh, 39.209 Apple Aperitif. Apple Aperitif. So I've decided to hijack one of our colleagues' uh, cocktail recipe. So Simone down at our London venue created this cocktail and I've put it into the email for everyone tonight. It's a really simple but very fresh cocktail and that's the whole point. This should be summer. We're in Edinburgh and Glasgow where it's been 21 degrees here and now it is sodden wet and a little bit cold and a little bit damp. So this would have been perfect at two o'clock this afternoon. So what I have in front of me is uh, 25 mils of the apple aperitif, the 70, uh, the 39209, I am human. <laughs> um, mix that in with some fever tree uh, rose tonic, which is quite fresh and quite citrusy. We've added 12 mils of lemon juice and an interesting little garnish. So I've changed the normal highball glass up into a champagne flute. 
mainly being because you should be using a double measure of whiskey in this, to be honest. So you get that alcoholic kick, but also the fresh notes. But also the closed end of the glass, you know, really curtails those flavours. And with the garnish of the lemon, and I've put a frozen strawberry in there as well because it just lasts a little bit longer, keeps the drink a little bit colder, and you don't get that dilution from the from the ice. So, you know, it's a smart play. And once you finish with it, you've got a nice big strawberry to chew on as well. So, have a sip, have a taste. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. So one so, thing I will say about our, our cocktail, sorry, Andrew, um, is that it, this cocktail and other cocktails, you'll be able to find them in this month's Unfiltered. So each venue came up with two serves. Um, you can try them in the venues if you're close to a venue or you can uh, make the recipes at home. So we've shared the the rose. Um, if I, I never offered you a rose garden, um, but there are others. There's a smoky old fashioned um, and, um, and they're really refreshing. They're really easy to make. You don't need a shaker. So feel free to try them um, another time if you haven't tried them tonight. Cool. What I'm doing just now is putting a little bit into these unfiltered pieces just to help them bring, bring them to life for you. And we we had a great uh, collaboration with the team from Bramble that came in and they've done some amazing cocktails as well. So if you're not from Edinburgh or coming to there, we highly recommend going to Bramble. Or coming to that area where Queen Street is, so stop off at Queen Street, have a dram of a cocktail there, then move on to these guys. They've won multitude of awards throughout the world. They really know their stuff. And yeah, they like working with us because we you know every cask is different. We've got so many different flavours, and that's why we're great for cocktails. Although, you know, it begs the question, if you're not having a cocktail tonight, what is the dram like? So it's a nine-year-old Speyside whiskey. It's really light. It's really fruity. So throughout the evening, you would have noticed that they're all bourbon barrels. That's not a coincidence. June is our cocktail month, so any one of these five whiskies you have in front of you are very, very first, uh, versatile. You know, they've all got nuances with the same vanilla and oak, but also the way the spirit's made, how long it's been aged. If the cast has been used more than once, it's going to give you a lot of different flavour. Although, you know, it is all bourbon barrels. Don't be disheartened. When you go through these five, you're going to, to really enjoy different flavours. And that's what we're here to do. So the first one, I've got two Elgin distilleries to go to. Doesn't mean anything, but these would be your stereotypical Speyside whiskies because they're all light, fruity. There's hints of citrus all the way through every single one. And they're made, what, five miles away from each other at a stretch in Elgin, but they are completely different drams. The still houses are set up different ways. They've got different fermentation. So this one, they went for a clear style of wort. So that is in the fermentation side of things. So you're looking at, you know, that kind of sweet, fruity, slightly nutty esters. So when it comes to distillation, you get that real nice lightness coming off the spirit. And that's what we're looking for in this in this dram. So pretty simple, pretty easy going. First of all, bourbon barrel, which means it's the first time it's had Scotch whiskey in it. So you've got that slight carry over, carry over of the bourbon notes, which again is that, you know, coconutty, slightly deep and richer, caramel just with that toasted oak still lingering at the back and yeah i think for a nine-year-old whiskey it's got a lot of flavor it's got, got a lot of depth and it's sort of light and delicate so this is why i've used it in this particular cocktail the tonics the citrus and a little bit of the red fruit really elevate some of those lovely styles that are still in those in those whiskies hope it makes sense folks now i've used all of my whiskey in my cocktail unfortunately or fortunately depending on your on your preference, I want you guys to come in and tell me what your tasting notes are. So remember, you'll have a copita glass in front of you, ideally, but any stemmed glass with a narrow, uh, narrow, sh narrow shoulder and a big butt always works because you won't get a swirling essence in, but have the, the nasal capacity at the head of the glass. And when you're nosing the whiskey, you know, Richard Patterson does it very well. He goes, hello, how are you? And very well, thank you very much. Because that way you're nor, uh, you're bringing your nasal olfactory bulbous to life by warming up. And when it comes to taste, you're warming your taste buds up as well. So I always recommend in my tastings is to take a little sip, 
hold it in your mouth, swirl it around, swallow, and give yourself 60 seconds before your next sip. Now, interestingly, this is 56.5% ABV. For some of the new people, you say, oh God, that's really strong. But we can quite easily go up to 65, 66, 68 in some cases. Um, and that's you know a different element. So what that is, is a little bit of a poison reaction to your body. So you're gonna to start to salivate. Your body's gonna go into a slight shock. So taking that little sip, letting your body adjust for 60 seconds, then take another sip. And what should happen is you won't salivate as much, but you're able to start to break down those alcoholic barriers and just slowly ease into the whiskey. And also by the time you've done that with your fifth dram, you know, you'll get all the flavors that you need to get from the whiskey. We also do say adds a bit of water. That's going to bring that dilution down a little bit, release more of those ar aromatics, change the complexity of the whiskey. Nine times out of 10, it's great. It works. It helps you out. But sometimes it doesn't. So we always recommend if you've got a bigger, bigger dram, half it in the glass, half add some water into one glass, keep the other one neat. And then you've got two drams out of one glass, which is, you know, a good Scottish way to go about it. <laughs> so, I tend to agree. Yeah. We've got some yeah. good comments coming in there as well, Andrew, about some tasting notes. Uh, so Malthound cool. says uh, sugar cane sweetness, coconut tropical notes with toffee. Um, Mark Lindsay, nose is fresh and fruity, some solvent airfix glue, taste is apple sours. Um, and David Reed says apple aperitif, very smooth. I think I'm going to add oh, some water. So surprise, it's a nine-year-old whiskey. Mm. Oh, well, a lovely a depth to it. Um, that Angostura bark in the tonic water that you've that you paired with this whiskey has just brought so many lovely characters out of uh, generally like a lovely straightforward sweet whiskey. So I think they've complemented each other beautifully. Um, but I should have maybe poured a little bit in the glass just to see. But um, lovely, lovely cocktail. It's really nice. So yeah, hat off to Simone. And obviously it's much warmer down in London than it is up here. Mm -hmm. So perfect sipping whiskey and perfect sipping for, for a cocktail like this. Um, other cocktails, you know, keep it light, keep it fruity. There's nothing wrong with the good old fashioned highball in my eyes. But you can play with those tonics now, like we know the Fentimans are doing really well and Fever Tree. Um, the... The Angostura bitter ones would work quite well in the mm -hmm. tonic region. So a little bit of that would be would be brilliant, I think. We've got another cocktail later on as well with the the 35. I'll take you through that at this stage. Mm -hmm. But yeah, how's the how's the tasting that's coming on, Mads? Yeah, um great. Uh we've got some some more notes. Uh we've actually got a quick question. Uh is this one sold out already? No, it is not. So you can purchase no. um this bottling tonight. Uh you can purchase it now, you can wait until the end of the evening. Um, but if you like it, we'd recommend you get a hold of it while you can. Um Fran says uh her dad or uh their dad, um, this is his Father's Day gift, says he's tasting apples and hazelnuts. And I think the nuttiness of this particular flavor profile in particular. Um, is a really lovely light thing that works really well in your cocktail, Andrew, but just across this mm -hmm. flavor profile generally um, yeah. with, with all of those kind of lighter and florally notes, it really ties in with what we're working on this month as well with Jason Scott from Bramble. Absolutely, but, definitely. Um, um, another little bit, tip bit of this, this is what's great about uh, the SMWS and other independent bottlers like us is getting access to this whiskey you wouldn't normally see, or this distillery, if you want to focus on you know, distillery portfolios, this is used 95%, 96% in blends. They only have one portfolio bottle that they'll come out with. We're not gonna say the distillery because we, I don't want you to think about the distillery and what you've potentially tasted. Every single cask the society does is all about experimentation and it's about flavor diversity and you know, pushing those boundaries. And for, for 52 pounds, this is probably a, a flavor profile that you wouldn't normally go for either. You know, light and delicate, we don't see too much of it. But this just works an absolute treat, particularly for this mm -hmm. time of year. It's, yeah, it ticks all the boxes in my eyes. I'd agree with that. I think a lot of um, a lot of members will sometimes, because it doesn't come up very often, you think light and delicate, you you might not go for it immediately. But some of the most surprising whiskies I've had 
have been from this profile. And there's one in particular that was quite effervescent, effervescent, almost a bit fizzy. And I just, yeah. I loved it. Um, I recently found another bottle at Queen Street and, and, and after I'd finished the first, got myself a second one because it was that good. Absolutely. You know, isn't it funny how from these raw ingredients, from water, barley and yeast and wood and some patience and the right bottling time that you can get all these weird congeners and flavours and smells from something that you'd normally look at go, oh, no, this is just, it looks like a plain old whiskey. But no, there's so many different elements and different levels to this whiskey as well. And that's why it's so prized as a blend, because it's a big, heavy hitter when it comes to that flavour and viscosity inside the glass. That's why blenders love using this. No, definitely. And we've got some really good notes coming in as well. Martin Shand, grapefruit and apples, also worked well with a white chocolate button. White chocolate, that was actually, that was one of the suggested food pairings and yep. works Love a it. treat with this one, um, as does shortbread, either plain shortbread or if you've got a, a lemon shortbread or an Earl Grey or a lavender shortbread, that would be really nice with this tram as well. Um, yeah. And and Greg Milney says he, he um, it's got an afterkick, but definitely light and delicate. He'd be interested to see how it tastes in a cocktail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would recommend if you're using the cocktail, you try not to drown it out with other ingredients. You know, you want that spirit kick still to be in there and those lighter nuances of the whiskey still to be flowing in. So quite a fine balance. That's why I, I really looked at the glassware I'm using tonight because of the amount of alcohol I've got and try and balance it out. Uh, we're not sure about the bourbon distillery that the original cask was from. It's still quite difficult to get that information. Um, most of them are very generic by the time they come over and be aged for another nine years. So that distillery that's been aged in shouldn't really affect the final product too much. But very good question, Not We'd have to go to the warehouse to find out, to be honest. Um, yeah, and find it within the 10,000 plus casks that we've used <laughs> or got, got squirreled away in our stores. Kathy's getting apple, vanilla, caramel and oak, which are all, yeah, I think this is such a good dram to start the evening off with because it just, it uncovers, there are more and more things in it that you kind of slowly reveal themselves. So definitely come back to it later in the evening um, if you've still got some left, don't feel you need to finish it all now. Um, yeah. But uh, I think if you're if you're finished, Andrew, um, it'd be a really good yeah. time to, to move on to the next dram, um, which Andrew Reed is presenting, um, 73.121 Mimos Moon Pie, which is quite difficult to say. That is a bit of a mouthful. We'll see if we can manage, though. Um, so, yeah, no, I just wanted to touch on that point that you made there, Mads, and I believe it was Leslie Harrison that uh, said she was going to save some uh, of the first dram to come back to later. And I think in a uh, tasting where you've got multiple whiskies in front of you, I think it's such an important thing to uh, to realise that your palate is, is constantly changing all the time. Um, so when you try this first whisky, if you've tried it neater, whether it's in a cocktail, um, you have the next two, three, four drams in succession. And then you revisit this whisky and you'll realise it's totally changed for you. Um, and it's just your palate developing uh, over time and getting used to uh, not just the strength of whiskey, but the diversity and flavor that you've got in front of you. So I think it's a very, uh, it's a good thing. It's a good exercise to do if you're doing a tasting to, as hard as it is, to save a little bit in the in the glass and then revisit it later on. Um, so I would absolutely do that. Got a little bit in my, in my cocktail glass waiting. So uh, we'll go back to that one. But without further ado, we'll go on to Mimo's Moon Pie. You're right, Mads, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, thought I would nail it, but never mind. Um, so it's the 73121. Um, it's been a while since I uh, saw a 73 expression coming to uh, any of the venues. This one is an absolute stunner. Um, big fan of this distillery. It is a space side, but it is one of the few space side distilleries that you could possibly say is a coastal distillery. Um, very small area in uh, in the northeast of Scotland where you could say it's still space side, but it's still on the coast. Um, but lovely buttery base spirit. Um, 
again, first fill bourbon cask. Um, so you're getting a little bit of the bourbon influence, um, but still quite a creamy, rich spirit. And I think it's a lovely step up to go from a whiskey from the Elgin cluster, which I would say are you know, very light orchard fruits, very palatable. This one's a little bit more rich and spicy. Um, still part of the sweet fruit and fruit, sweet, fruity and mellow flavor profile. Um, so you're getting a nice sort of um, lovely cakey sort of uh, flavor from it and a nice mouthfeel, coat the palate, uh, a lasting flavor. I mean, just on the nose, I'm, I don't know about anybody else, but that is full on strawberries for me. Lots of lovely strawberry notes, uh, sort of the more red fruits. Um, and this one is, uh, we've paired this one with a Tunnock's Tea Cake. Um, I don't know if anyone is uh, unfortunate enough not to have tried a Tunnock's Tea Cake, but an absolute staple in Scotland. Um, just reminds me of my grandmother's house, which, um, funnily enough, was situated about 10 miles away from this distillery. Um, so it was almost as if she was training me up to this moment. Um, I'm quite excited about that. But no, on the nose, lovely, lovely red fruits, a little bit of a chocolatey sort of creamy uh, finish. Um, yeah, lovely lingering taste, a nice sort of mouthfeel coats the palate and the flavor carries on just beautifully. A um, little bit of water might just sort of take the edge off of the warmth. But um, if you're experiencing the same kind of weather that we are here in Leith, then um, you might want a bit of warmth in the back of your whiskey. And, but I'm going to add water just to see what happens because I say, why not? Absolutely. I would say just more of the creamy notes coming out on the nose almost immediately. Lovely, lovely whiskey. I think uh, one of the reasons we chose this particular food pairing is because um, I'm not sure everyone here will have had a moon pie. It's quite an American thing. Um, but it's essentially two graham crackers, not graham crackers because we're in America, graham crackers. Um, with a marshmallow filling and then that is dipped in usually chocolate but can be dipped in a lot of other things as well and um, so it's essentially a bit like a s'more but um, without the marshmallow being melted um, and I was thinking about it and drawing a blank and I kind of said to someone they were like oh Tunnock's tea cake it's practically the same thing um, so it'll be interesting to see what what everyone makes of this in particular. No it is uh, it, yeah, pretty much it's the same thing just a different shape um, I was lucky enough to have a moon pie once, and I kept pronouncing the graham cracker wrong. It's not Graham. Uh, I know many Grahams, and <laughs> definitely not the same thing. Um, but no, a lovely, lovely pairing. You're getting the nice milk chocolate, the shortbread biscuit on the bottom, and you know, in the middle, lovely sort of marshmallow center. I'm going to attempt to bite into this and not make an absolute mess. Yeah, I took a very small bite, I have to admit, just out of an abundance of caution. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same. I just don't want to embarrass myself on camera by putting it all in my mouth at once. <laughs> I was going to say, normally, normally, me a bit like a, a, a... Scoff it. No, no, sorry, um, Andrew. It reminds me of a wagon, a wagon wheel. I used to go through packets of them as a kid, which had the kind of okay. marshmallow centre as well. Des describe what a wagon good. wheel is. I think I vaguely know, but for the for the non UK people it's in the building, pop. it's like a soft soft um, biscuit base, but quite wide, so they're quite big, about that size. Um, covered in chocolate, and they've got a marshmallow center as well, yeah, all, right. all the way through. The mini cake. If you're lucky enough, you get ones with jam in the middle, and they're absolutely fantastic. Okay. Yeah, that would be one way to elevate this. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you imagine Dude, spreading so funny jam on the bottom of a tea cake. Um, just to say, isn't it funny how we always for... seem to... Go ahead. I was just going to say, isn't it funny how you always seem to go back to sweetness and kids' memories and things like that with, with these style of whiskies? It's just, it makes me giggle every time. Yeah, carry on. That's my... No, no, I, I agree. I think there's something to be said because at the end of the day, I think there's a certain comforting aspect in whiskey that is a bit of that 
maltiness that you actually find in biscuits or maybe really like um, sugary tea, like milk, um, milky tea with lots of sugar, which I don't drink now, but I did drink a lot of when I was younger. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, There's definitely to... something in, in just about every whiskey that you have. I think that's why whiskey, and especially whiskey at, um, at the Scots Malt Whiskey Society is such uh, an incredible thing because um, not only are you looking at the flavor in the, that, um, that you're experiencing in the glass, but you're also sort of tying that to an experience that you have previously had. And uh, you know, nine times out of 10, that's something that is ingrained in your memory and in your mind. So um, of course it would be something that reminds you of your childhood, for example. So as I say, um, this reminds me of just about anything tonics. So I saw there was a, a comment um, a little bit uh, a while ago that said uh, no tonics tea cakes but they've got a caramel log um i would say that's an absolute uh, smasher that one absolutely fantastic uh you're still getting the caramel notes out of this whiskey um and the nuttiness as well from for example the wafer uh layers in the caramel log um because you know this distillery uh produces cloudy wort which you know, you're, you're talking about a much more nutty character rather than if you had clear wort, for example. Um, that would be much more of your sort of fruity, estery kind of flavours. But no, this one, a little bit nuttier, a little bit more of the biscuity, malty flavours, um, which I'm sure everyone watching can attribute at least one of their memories to something that was like nice and sweet and biscuity, um, just lathered in caramel and you know that's a memory that we're all absolutely fond of i'm sure mm. definitely i'm just going to jump in here we've had a question um from suparno to run through tonight's um list again of the of the cask number so i'm just going to do that quickly so we started with 39.209 and we're now on 73.121 um next up it'll be 36.164 followed by 35.269 and then 10.204. Um, but yeah, some great some great tasting notes coming through. Um, so Mark Lindsay, uh, Kulki Indian ice cream on nose, tropical fruits, iron brew sorbet, which I've never had, but that sounds like it would be really tasty. Um, and uh, we've got uh, Stuart saying, You're, aren't you meant to eat a tea cake in one go? Maybe, but perhaps not when you're on camera. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what I was thinking, not on camera. Um, not Cal is getting vanilla milkshake, uh, Suparna Ray, Horlicks. Um, David's uh, got shortbread and uh, Anne Bingham is saying that caramel log works brilliantly. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. No, that's, that is one that just lasts and lasts and lasts. Lovely, lovely flavour. A nice spice, even with a bit of water, you're getting that warmth still. Um, the water just sort of separates the flavours from the alcohol, so you're getting a little bit more of that flavour, if anything. But a nice a nice space-side hug, as I like to call it. Keeps you cosy. And speaking of cosy, um, the next dram is very Christmassy, I think, so... Are you ready? Is everyone ready to move on to the next dram, dram roughly? I can't speak tonight. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let's let's shimmy on to the next one. Again. Back at Fantastic. time. Fantastic. Um, Sorry, Andrew, on you go. I was going to say, there was a little question coming from Christian about how the expressions are allocated. Is this the, the flavour profiles? Christian that you're you're on about. Hopefully inside, if you're watching with our packs, there is the descriptions of the 12 flavor profiles. Have a look at that and it kind of describes some of its lighter fruity, sweet fruity and mellow, which we're using a lot tonight. If it's peated or, or if it's, you know, yeah. So we brought that in roughly 2016 when we had the old style of labels, which I have behind me. So if you're glancing at the bar, that was the old labels that we had, and it didn't really give you much of a description of what's inside the bottle unless you got the tasting note. So now you can stand back and you see this wall of color at any one of our bars, and that will help you start to hone in what you're looking for. And yeah, the numbers work quite simply. Um, 
Hopefully it doesn't fall. Still a mat to fall over, Andrew. <laughs> no. That's, that is a very, very, very famous bottling, that one in society. It's got cult status. That is the whiskey-flavoured condoms and skunk roadkill bottle. So I managed to get myself a little cheeky bottle of that through my own ways and means. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, so distillery one, cast number one, is very well documented. We started at Glenfarclas. But one of the main things is they didn't want to put the name of distillery in the bottle because they didn't have the control factor. We were bottling it. So they wanted nothing to do with this. So that's where the decimal point system really started. And we've just been continuing on from there. Also, it's really good that we don't put distillery names on the bottle because we don't want that preconceived conception of what you might be tasting. The amount of times when I worked in Queen Street on my days, we'd have someone come up saying, I want a Glenmorangie. You'd give them one, but it would be slightly peated, for example, because it's been aged in a peaty cask or they've just done something completely different. That's what you want to do. You want to give that flavor exploration. And that's what we really focus on as on society. So that's why we've got our 12 flavor profiles, no names of distilleries. We tell you about the cask and we do have a brief tasting note. And then, you know, the best thing and the most fun thing to do is go and see Andrew at the vaults and walk through a couple of samples and he will sort you out with the dram that you're looking to do. I mean, we're all experienced bartenders. So if you like to drink Glenmorangie, for example, we'd be able to get you on a slightly different path of hopefully whiskey enjoyment. That's what we do. No, absolutely. I think on um, on the back of that, um, so yes, we don't talk about which distillery um, has made the particular expression that is in your glass if you come into any of the society venues. Um, but it's a very good thing to let us know what you normally drink because that gives us an idea of the style of whiskey that you're after. Um, and that's something that uh, we can certainly build on because, you know, without the back and forth uh, between the, uh, the ambassadors and the members, uh, we're never going to know what your palate is really after if you come into one of the venues. So I always say that whiskey is a point of conversation. It's always something that you build up. Um, I mean, if we're lucky enough to get it right first time, then fantastic. But um, sometimes, you know, there, there is a whiskey that, you know, potentially just wasn't right for you. And the best thing you can do is be honest about that and tell us what you didn't like so we can move on from that. Um, I mean, in terms of the vaults bar, we've got about four, maybe 500 different bottles. So we're going to find one of them. We probably won't go through all of them in one night, but um, <laughs> well, we'll find one of them for you. And because we're all, um, I suppose, self-professed, um, flavor champions you know we know what people are looking for and we know what people should maybe give a shot um that that was a bad word to use I, I didn't mean to say shot we don't shot whiskey here um but no it's it's all a point of conversation so do be very honest and do just let us know what you think about the whiskeys because that's the most important thing you can say to us yeah. Yeah. Well, just just before you crack on you know a good touch point question is we've got about 150 single malt distilleries now, 15 grain whiskies plus bourbon, cognac, armniac. There's a lot for you to decipher. So yeah, the more time you spend at tastings or with um, or with the team or along with us, it's, yeah, you soon learn what, what you like and what flavor profiles you want to go for yeah. and be open to changes. And I, and I think that the having an open mind about it is probably the most important thing. Um, when I started working at the society, I didn't really like peated whiskey, but I didn't realize how many different types of peat there were. You know, you've got your medicinal peat, you've got your kind of more industrial peat. Um, so it, it's all about finding flavors that you enjoy. And even if you say something like, I really like uh, whiskey that, that tastes a little bit like rye bread, someone will be able to take that and, and help you find a whiskey, a society whiskey that you enjoy. Absolutely. No, fantastic. I mean, that's exactly exactly what I would say. Um, I see uh, Suparno Ray has said, God help us if we go through even 10 of the 500. Uh, so hopefully uh, we won't get to that stage. Um, the worst thing that is going to happen is the first one is not quite to your palate. And then nine times out of 10, the second one is going to be a little bit more because it, the first time you walk in, it can be quite daunting seeing all of these bottles with all of these strange codes on them. But as soon as you try that first one, we've got a really good idea of what 
uh, what to give you. So um, it's it's just the best thing to do is to come into any of the venues and talk to any of the ambassadors. I mean, that's a really good idea. Good. Um, but yeah, so um, so I'll crack on with the next whiskey. So we have thirty six point one six four, which is called Bittersweet Christmas Stocking Treat. Um, now this one is right up my street. This one is another space side whiskey, but for me a bit closer to home. Um, so some of you who may have or may not have been to my tastings before, I'll usually mention the fact that I'm from uh, space side. I'm from right in the heart of space side in a little town called Aberlour. And if you've ever had expressions like the Aberlour Abuna, for example, that's a really famous one that uh, attributed to Christmas cake quite a lot. You're getting the really rich, dark fruits, the nuttiness, the spice, the nutmeg and cinnamon, just exactly what you would imagine these Christmassy flavors to impart. Um, but this one is not from um, Aberlour. This is a little bit up the road. Now, this one, immediately you're getting a little bit more of the dark citrus flavors. Um, still quite creamy, but it's darker and uh, more fruity, much more of the fruit flavors. So that's why we've paired this one with a bit of chocolate orange. Um, so for those of you who have prepared your chocolate orange uh, already, like fantastic. Um, if some of you are scrambling into your uh, cupboards and trying to find the nearest thing, good stuff, like best of luck to you. Um, but this one is a lovely whiskey to have with um, a bit of dark chocolate, I would say. It doesn't need to be flavored with orange. We're just saying that, uh, that the orange goes well because of those citrusy notes. I mean, immediately on the nose, very, very orangey. Um, now this one again is first fill bourbon cask. Um, so exactly the same kind of cask as uh, the previous whiskey, 73.121. And this is just to highlight that, um, you know, that you, you might get bourbon influences from these uh, styles of cask. But mainly what you should see a cask is, um, is, a, is basically a reaction vessel. So you're talking about the individual spirits that come from these different distilleries. And these, um, these casks will bring out certain flavors. They'll, they'll mature them, essentially. So uh, you're either looking for additive or subtractive flavors. They're going to react over time. And it totally depends on the spirit as to how the, the final product is bottled. Um, so this distillery, in my mind, um, is a little bit more on the heathery side as a base spirit. You're getting much more of the sort of honey heather flavors. Um, and then a little bit of the, the oak reaction will give it a little bit more of the spicy Christmas cake flavors. But um, heather honey is one that I would normally attribute to distillery number 36, which again, I haven't seen in quite a while. So it's really good to revisit this distillery. It's a nice spicy space side. Generally, people attribute space sides to you know, the light creamy apple pear sort of vanilla. Um, whereas this one has just turned that on its head and said, here's a nice spicy one for you, a nice warming whiskey. Um, so lovely with a bit of chocolate orange. Um, one of those weird distilleries that partially triple distills their whiskey. And I'm not going to go too much into that because that's, that's a whole different tasting. It's going to take another hour and a half that we don't have, sadly. Um, but you're looking for like sort of a, a light, clean spirit that's got these heavier flavors in it. It's got a nice fruitiness on the back uh, of the palate, on the finish, if you like. Um, but lovely, lovely style of spirit. And there's some um, good tasting notes coming in too. Oh. Um, we've got uh, plums in a mild rum soaked Christmas cake from Suparno Ray, Mark Lindsay, uh, nose banana on buttered toast. Oh custard creams on the palette, orange marmalade, Jaffa cakes. Uh, Greg Milne is wondering what makes it a Vaults exclusive? So what yep. makes this a Vaults exclusive is just literally in that description. It, you can only ever have bought this whiskey in the Vaults. Now, I might be wrong in saying this, but I believe it was released in 2019. Um, I think we're just going to forget the last year ever happened. There's, I don't think there was many Vaults exclusives in 2020. But uh, 2019 was when this was released. And the only place you could get this bottle of whiskey was in the Vaults uh, at 87 Giles Street in Leith, which also happens to be the home of the society. This was the first venue that was opened 
in terms of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society by Pip Hills and his merry band of friends, his whiskey enthusiasts. Um, and it's it's a lovely place. If you've never been, um, then essentially just picture a big living room. Lovely, cosy atmosphere, uh, very warm and welcoming, and a very big whiskey bar. But that, we can say that about most of the venues, I would say. Um, but this is the home of the society, and this was the room that I'm sitting in, the very room I'm sitting in, is called the tasting room because this is where the panel would traditionally uh, sample the whiskies that were coming straight out of the cask. You know, they would do them blind, so there was no preconception as to distillery character. They might have been told the age or maybe the cask type, but none of that mattered. It was all about whether it was ready or not to be bottled. So that's something very important to remember with the society is that if it's made it into the bottle, then a good few members of the tasting panel at the very least have enjoyed that. And there is a dram for every tongue. Um, so that's that's why it's so good to, um, you know, sample some in, in succession because it really hones in to your palate as to uh, what they have decided is at the end of the day, uh, an absolutely smashing dram, which I think I'm sure you'll all agree this is an absolute belter. Lovely, lovely stuff. Yeah, I think. Go on, you go, Mads. I was, I was just going to say when I was <laughs> trying these drams last week, I was blown away. You know, sometimes you get a, a name and it is very accurate for the bottling, and sometimes it takes a bit more time to work out kind of what what the panel were talking about. But this one. I tried it the first time and I was like, wow, that really is Christmas in a dram for me. And without a doubt, I knew it had to be dark chocolate and orange. Um, I think Parna Ray said he he has lint dark chocolate with orange rinds and that's exactly what I have. That and does. it's just splendidly, yeah, it goes splendidly with this dram. It's like Christmas morning um, when you've had too much sugar because your parents let you have all the chocolate. Uh, maybe not all the whiskey when you're a child, but yeah. <laughs> What I find with this chocolate is it, it coats your mouth, so I don't want to put any water in my whiskey. It just gives you a really nice mouthfeel and balance when you're, when you're drinking this, and the spiciness of the orange really complements the the whiskey in itself. It's just, yeah, it is a little glass of Christmas in my eyes. Yeah, no, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful pairing. Um, it's a very difficult thing uh, to pair whiskey with food. Sometimes you're looking at something that actually contrasts the flavor of the whiskey. So for example, if you were looking for a light buttery sweet whiskey, you might go for potentially a nice salty cheese to sort of fight against that on your palate and then they, they balance each other out. But this one has uh, complemented that dark chocolate with orange perfectly. And I think um, you absolutely nailed it. I haven't added water to this yet because the chocolate is just complementing it so well. And also we have had, um, you know, two whiskies prior to this. I hope we haven't finished them all yet, but we've we've at least tasted two. So our palates are warmed up. We're looking for these individual flavours like the Christmas cake and the chocolate orange. And they're just doing so beautifully together. Yeah. I, th I think as well with pairing food and whiskey, it, it is, as you say, Andrew, it is a challenge. And the first couple of times I tried my hand at it for these tastings, I just sat there and I had a really sore head after from just thinking so hard about the flavor in the whiskey and the flavor in the food. And I've said this in tastings before, but the best way to do food and whiskey pairings, if you have the time, is to sit there with a couple of drams and a table full of different snacks that you think might work and then try the whiskey and try different things until you find something that works for you. Um, and if there's two of you doing it uh, or more, if you have a couple of uh, people that really enjoy whiskey, make it a social thing. Um, it's one of those things where you can just sit there and discuss flavor and talk about it in a way that's that's really fun and you'll all have a different take on it, um, which is great. Oh, we've got a tough job, don't we, Mads? Really mm, tough job. Really tough, very hard. Worst job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> No, this one's absolutely stunning. I'm seeing some amazing tasting notes. I think um, the best thing that I've noticed is just in general, you know, at the start, it is quite difficult to um, pick out all of these individual flavors um, from such a strong whiskey. But, you know, two or three whiskeys in, we're getting almost essays coming through of 
these incredibly in-depth flavors. And, you know, I wouldn't disagree with anyone that I've seen yet. Uh, Martin Chan saying butterscotch on the nose, orange marmalade to taste, uh, dark chocolate, no need for a drop of water. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Like really sort of beautiful caramel notes and the orange is just, I think we're all kind of stuck with the chocolate orange thing, but it just fits it so perfectly that we can't really deviate from that. It's just a beautiful, beautiful pairing, really lovely whiskey and yeah. a lovely chocolate. And that's why I was bottled just for the vaults as well. So yeah, very lucky that um, we're bringing this to you guys just to, you know, I'll probably get my wrist slapped for doing this, but I think it's worth it. You can't have a bottle like this just for such a small amount of people. You need to bring it to the world mm. in my eyes, particularly when it's, you know, you've got six months to Christmas. Get your Christmas presents sorted out, done and dusted. Oh boy, really, Andrew? <laughs> yeah. Quicker this the quicker this year gets passed and passed from me, I'll be happier. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I mean, just to elaborate on the uh, the Vaults exclusive bottles, every other venue does exclusive bottlings. Um, so it's not something that you only need to travel to Leith to get. Um, just recently uh, on the Battle of the Venues tasting, we tried uh, the London's venue exclusive, which I believe was a 35 of some kind uh, from Speyside. And it was just pineapple juice, papaya. So it was just gorgeous. And I only ever got to try that because it was in the tasting. We never got that up in Scotland and it's an absolute belter. So every single venue we go to um, out of the, you know, the four that we have in, um, in Britain, they will all have exclusive bottlings. And we also have the society casks as well, which um, there's something very satisfying to be said about having a dram straight out of the cask. Um, properly measured, of course, but lovely, lovely whiskey coming straight out of that. Um, and getting all that sort of woody essence in the whiskey. So just about every venue will have a, a society cask. Um, the Vaults has three, though, so you've got a lot to choose from. Yeah, lovely, <laughs> lovely. What I love about those casks is when you first get them into the bar, then you come back to them four weeks later, they're often very, very different, and you can really mm -hmm. feel that maturation take place. And you, you get to nurture that dram, changing it and watch it change and grow up, so to speak. It's like a little baby. It's just nice. Absolutely. Also, great value. Hmm. I, I think it's, they also make great gifts. If you're, you know, ever looking to give someone something, it's it's a nice thing and it's a, it's a slightly smaller bottle as well, uh, which unfortunately means when it's gone, it's gone. Uh, yeah. But it always, it means there's, there's always something uh, better around the corner. It's very bittersweet. I mean, it says it in the name of this whiskey that we're trying. It's bittersweet. Um, it's when it's gone, it's gone. But nine times out of ten, they're absolute bangers. Just wondering. So I'm seeing Greg Milne has said he's seeing a cast register in the background. Who would that be? I think it was um, some ice going into a glass for the. For oh the next right, okay. Beverage. I was thinking. I was just getting my myself set up in the the ice cubes that I've got when. Oh, fantastic. Over there. I mean, well, certainly happy to hand it over to you, Andy P. Sorry, Andrew P. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot my own rule there. That's my bad. Excuse me. Yeah, so I, I get called Parky. I get called Baldy quite a lot, but for some weird reason, Andy seems to rub me up the wrong way, of all things. Eh? Yeah. There you go. Totally, totally in agreement. And <laughs> Well, Thank just you, before sir. you jump on, Andrew, we had a question from Leslie Harrison. Um, can we order the exclusive whiskey if we apply directly to the venue? So if you're if you're visiting the venue, um, you can pick up a bottle there, uh, but it isn't one that you could kind of phone up and have um, shipped to you. That's not something we'd be able to do. Um, but if you're there, by all means, you know, if you're in London or Glasgow or Edinburgh, um, you can certainly purchase from the venue direct. Yeah, we I think we have stopped shipping from the venues. Yeah, we were doing that over lockdown, but now that they're open, they're fully busy now. We can't commit to that. So best thing to do is phone up and go in. Just like I said, and you can even try the whiskey when you're there as well, which is always a really good bonus. Uh, but the whiskeys that we do normally from these tastings are all exclusive to this tasting. They're on a secret website that only purchasers of the packs can get at. And in two weeks time, they will go onto the main site. That's that's the plan. But yeah, everything you're tasting tonight normally is exclusive to these EMTs. 
apart from the last one, unfortunately, that was part of the, the April long term. Because we needed to we needed to put some good peated whiskey online for everyone. <laughs> and we also had a question briefly from Not Cal about uh, Sky or Rasa venue, which would be amazing. Um, Andrew, I don't know uh, if you want to take that one, Andrew Park. <laughs> Yeah, so we do have a partner bar network throughout the UK that we are looking to expand. Um, the closest one to you, probably Inverness, that we're looking to go into. Then the next one above that is the famous Dornock Castle Hotel, which is really good. So we are in talks with different areas. And if you've got a bit of a, pardon me, interesting background or the, the bar has, you know, a good whiskey stock, I believe there is one in the centre of Skye where there's a campsite, I can't quite remember the name of it, but I think our Richard will know it pretty well. Um, that's certainly been on been our on our radar and partner bars are essential for what we do, you know, to bring the whiskey to the, bring the SMWS to our whiskey members and give them a home away from home is what we used to call it. So yeah, we're always looking to look at new, new friendships and new partnerships, particularly Isle of Skye and Rassi is beautiful. I've just came from that way. Um, on holiday, although it was pretty raining in Sky every time. But it was great to be up there. And the midges. Oh, yeah, the, the midges. midges. Mm. Yeah. All right, so shall we do do the cocktail? Let's do get, it. Get the, the most riskiest part <laughs> out of the way. So we're going to do uh, a style of old-fashioned. So old-fashioned, you normally have that in a nice big rocks glass with a big chunk of ice. Again, I've kind of thought about this, so... I've changed it to serve it up high, so it'll be more like a martini Sazerac style where you just have a chilled glass, chill the spirit down and put it in there. Again, the reason why I do that is I've got a small amount of whiskey and a small amount of the ice cubes I'm using are very small. So I don't want that dilution to happen too quickly. Again, that's the risk with these old school cocktails. So really simply, I've put about 10 mils of sugar syrup in here, a couple of dashes of Angostura bitters. I'm going to fire in some ice, fire in my dram. Um, I don't know if anyone watches Danny Dyer with Grant's Whiskey on Instagram. He does something really simple called 60 Second Serves. And it's kind of this kind of quite, quite a slapdash style. So I've got it in here, got my bar spoon, give that a little stir. And what I'm looking for is just to this, the metal tends to start icing up. That's where I know I've got it at the right temperature. As well, I should be tasting this all the way through so I don't go past that rate of dilution. So this is one of the oldest cocktails in the world. So really cocktails first came about because the spirit that they had was pretty, it wasn't stored in any good wood. Pretty rough, pretty ready. They were still getting the distillation techniques down in the early 1800s, so you know it was quite fiery spirit. So we started to add sugar and a little bit of water or soda just to make it more palatable. And it said they used to have this for breakfast to help even you out before the start of your day. So you can imagine what people got up to during then. And I absolutely love that idea sometimes of having a cheeky drink in the morning. But God knows how they managed to survive. So that's nice and cold. Put it into my little martini glass or Mary Antoinette. So it's got this nice pinkish hue. Again, you'd be wanting to double the, the spirit quantity. Add maybe a little bit more sugar syrup, depending on your taste. And you want just a nice bit of orange rind. You can squeeze that over as well. Or if you want to be flashy and use a flamed orange. Personally, I don't see too much of a difference apart from getting a more of a burnt note, but this is, you know, cast strength whiskey. I want that to not be overpowered by a garnish. So that orange zest, the oils will that just coat over the top of the whiskey. Cocktail, there you go. You've got a nice little old fashioned. And how easy and quick was that? I should be mm, beautiful glass cheap. as well. I love it. Mm. Beautiful glass, Andrew was saying. Yeah, it's, well, the theory is it's shaped on Marie Antoinette's boob. It's more like my size of boob these days after COVID, <laughs> I tell you. So that being said, that is just a beautiful cocktail that you can sit 
and relax and enjoy quite quickly. Um, brilliant alternatives to this. Normally I would use bourbon, particularly Woodford bourbon. But the way the reason why I went for this style of whiskey in this age is a 16 year old single malt from Elgin again. It's because it has got that slightly heavier and richer and a little bit more of the toffee notes coming through from that additional aging in the cask. In the cask. Oh, feedback. And I think it works really well with this. And it's just, yeah, it just works quite well as a smooth, easy going whiskey. I could mm -hmm. have that cocktail all day, every day, to be honest. I love the old fashions and the Sazeracs and the, the Manhattans. I love the older style of whiskeys, to be honest. So we, we touched on, and I want to touch on this as well, is this is distillery number 35 society is my go-to whiskey or distillery portfolio to break down those preconcepts. You will find our standard bottlings in any supermarket ranging from 18 to 22 pounds, depending on what style they have. And people think because it's, it's so cheap, it's not going to be a superior style of whiskey. So if I was to tell you exactly what this distillery was, if I was serving you, some people, and I've seen it, put their nose up and think, no, I don't want to try that. I want to try something else. Give them this. Give them this as a single malt, and it just blows your mind. Then you start to realise what they've been up to in the past. So it's a former Glenmorangie distillery, and the the main guy at uh, Glenmorangie, Arbeg, is Dr Bill Lumsden, and he really pioneered the way in the early 90s of using different cast types. You know, it was his experimentation vessel, and that's we've seen a lot of that benefit when we started to work with this uh, company more, this distillery, because we got a lot of funky casks. Best ones were the 22, 23 year old toasted oak range that we had coming out. Series of 35s coming through and every single one was, you know, it knocks your socks off. That's what I love to see. And this for me is really where I started to appreciate the society for what they do. Again, this is a first fill ex bourbon barrel. We've had four of these already. This is the best one for me. Not because it's age, but it's because that depth of flavor that uh, this distillery produces. And you know, it's sweet fruity mellow again, but completely different from the other two sweet fruit mellows that we've had. So that's why I love, you know, opening up concepts. So I'd love to hear what everyone's thinking back home when they're drinking it neat. And you guys, what have you been, what have your thoughts on the, on the whiskey nosed neat and with a wee dram of water if you've got it? I think it's, uh, right. it's quite intense. Um... And I actually, Maltown's said intense, just as I was saying it. Um, mm. But I, it's there's a lot of flavour there to unpack, um, yeah. and I think um, a fair bit of of wood as well. But it's very sweet, um, and I kind of I want to try it, but also want to nose it a bit longer to see what else comes out of it. Yeah. So this bottle was specifically used for our festivals. So you will see on the bottle, it's got a slightly different label. So we use an artist uh, based down in London, I believe, called, called Mark, oh, sorry, Mike Hall, who does all the distill, uh, does all the labels by hand. And this bottle was actually, the concept was derived by myself because I wanted to set this interesting little scene of Dunleith Docks with people carrying different flavours and you see the boats with different, little bits of pieces from the tasting notes in it to really bring it to life. So Mike has done this brilliantly on the bottom, which you'll see at home. So yeah, it took about six months to from concept to put onto a label. And I think you'll agree he's done a very good job of what it is. So pretty chuffed with that. And I'll be buying a bottle myself. And yeah, so this was for the festival structure. So for me, that if I'm talking to you at a festival, you've not really seen the society before. Just like I said, this is a great one to break down your concepts. You've got a crack and drive in front of you. It doesn't matter where it's from, but when you start to have that discussion, you know, that's the wow factor and that's what society does for me. And it just, oh, to make it, it's, yeah. I get excited, you can tell when I start so to think um, about this. There's one thing that I would like to revisit. There was a comment by uh, Suparna Ray about why chill the whiskey. Now, I'm no mixologist. I mean, the main cocktail that we do at the vaults is 25 ml of whiskey and a little dash of water. That's the main one. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would say probably it's not about chilling the whiskey. It's about bringing everything to you know a, a level uh, temperature so that it can mix 
properly in when you're mixing the cocktail? I'm I'm not too sure, but would you, would you elaborate on that? Yeah, apart from the only hot drink that I could think of is like a blue blazer where they're doing it with brandy and setting it on fire. But that's to bring out different flavor notes. For me, with these cocktails, they were chilled down to mask that fiery spirit. Mm. So you will get the Angostura, you'll get a little bit of the sweetness of the sugar, and you've got the orange peel. They'll all start to mix together, and it's probably just a little bit too chilled just now, but give that another five, ten minutes. And think about it. These were served in hot countries and hot bars. This started from America at the Waldorf Astoria in, um, in New York. So imagine having that in a busy, hot, coal-fired environment. You want something a little bit chilled. So, you know, if we're in Scotland, be quite nice but it just wouldn't mix as well either you want that ice to circulate around bring everything together and that's when you'll be able to sip and really properly enjoy that within two or three minutes where that temperature just evens out and you will get to get more of that flavor coming through and again that's why we say you, you know you don't want to put ice in your whiskey for that exact reason you want it to breathe and open up also if you're on a hot country you know you might struggle to you know drink a, a whiskey at 40 degrees so this is one of the reasons why but mainly, I think, down to unsuperior spirits. And just like I said, they were drinking it in the mornings. So, you know, it's a slight, slight change to a cup of tea, I suppose. Well, there was there was another reason as well. Um, and uh, Inca Larissa, who's a, a spirits and cocktail writer, she, um, she wrote a great article about why you should try whiskey cocktails this month. Um, and even if you're skeptical about putting one of our whiskeys in a cocktail, I'd, I'd say read this article um, because obviously whiskey was a really key ingredient during prohibition in the US. So they used a lot of um, smoky Isla whiskey. Um, and because it was prohibition, no one need, no one could know that you were drinking alcohol. So that's when they started using things like fruits and sugars and bitters to mask the alcohol in it. Um, but if you look at our spirits today and you know our whiskeys and also our gins and our Armagnacs and our Cognacs, they are full of diverse and complex flavors and they have so much flavor that actually you can really make those flavors shine and sing in a cocktail you're not you're not taking them away you're highlighting them so i would i would say read her article and um, she talks about how you know with our higher abv it's similar to having a cocktail with you know uh, navy strength rum or gin uh, which which are used quite frequently in cocktail trade um, but also it's about, you know, keeping it simple and embracing those flavors. So sweeter whiskey, maybe you do a mint julep or, um, you know, spicier whiskey, maybe you do a whiskey sour. Um, so it's all about taking those flavors and making them sing in cocktail form. So definitely give it a read um, if you're if you're skeptical and maybe it'll change your mind. Very well put, Mads. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, um, who is it just came in with one of my top top 10 bucket lists is to go to New Orleans and having a Sazerac. That's, that's uh, you know, one of my top 10s. Perfect Sazerac with brandy and, and whiskey. Is, oh, it's one, it was one of my favourite cocktails when I lived and worked in Melbourne. It was really good. But anyway, yes, spot on pier. Love your ice cream. I just need to quickly pick up some ice from the floor. <laughs> um, Anne Bingham's uh, is trying this uh, whiskey with olives, which, you know, I could see that working actually because there, there are a lot of wood notes in it and I think the olives might um, kind of pick up on some of the wood and sweetness and have quite an interesting um, pairing there. I'd, I'd be curious no. to try that one myself, actually. Absolutely. This is going back to what I was saying about um, a whiskey that's paired with almost the opposite of um, what the flavor sort of brings out because absolutely you're getting the woody notes. I'm thinking maybe a bit of olive and feta as well, although I could I could eat feta again for breakfast. Like I love that stuff. But something quite salty to uh, almost enhance the, the oaky notes, but also cut through the sweetness and then almost complement it. Um, yeah, green olives. If only I had a wee bowl with me just now, but that's a fantastic pairing. And uh, it's all I can think about now. <laughs> so thank you very think, much, Anne. 
I think Andrew might actually, Andrew Park might have olives. So I'd be curious for Andrew to try the jam with olives and see what he thinks of, of having the, the 35 with olives. I don't have any of the 35 left. Oh no. Oh, because you put yeah. it in your cocktail, of course. All, all in the cocktail. However, that would be a very interesting contrasting pairing. You know, it's a really nice, big, juicy Kalamata olive or something like that, I think would go really well. Something that's not just like a wee cocktail olive. You want the big ones you get in Greece, I would say. Yeah, spot on. That'd be a very interesting pairing. Mm. Oh, what size of olives are you eating, Andy? Like that size? <laughs> well, I just think of the big ones I got when I was in, in Corfu, because it was covered in olive trees, the, you know, the big, big, juicy ones. Oh. Sounds like an absolute luxury, you know, you don't have to go into Asda and get them in a jar. <laughs> You're just giving me a bit of wanderlust, Andrew, you know, talking about working in Australia and then being on Corfu and wanting to go to New Orleans. It's tough, isn't it? It's tough life. Yeah, it's tough life. <laughs> Shall we move on to the last round? I'm ready, if you are. Absolutely, let's do it. Um, so, I mean, this is one that I would say, initially I would say that this would be the best one out of the five to go with olives because something that's oily and coastal, you're, you're looking for, you know, a little bit of salinity in your whiskey to go with something as intense and salty as uh, green olives, for example. Um, but the, that last one, I really can't get the pairing of olives and uh, this whiskey out of my head. It's an absolutely beautiful suggestion. Um, but this one, Pineapples Ahoy, so 10.204, um, just on the nose, goes to show you you're never going to uh, know what would go best with this whiskey until you smell it for yourself. Now, personally, on the nose, it's much sweeter than I would ever have given it credit for. Um, you're, you're looking at an Isla whiskey here, so you would think um, automatically you're thinking of things like TCP, medicinal, wet bandages, things like that. Um, but this one is much sweeter, almost creamy as well. I mean, you're getting some of that oily and coastal notes, and I think it's a, the perfect uh, flavor profile for it. But it is very, very sweet. You're getting these tropical light notes, um, like the, the pineapple juice, uh, for example. Um, absolutely gorgeous stuff. Now, we've paired this one with... Um, with a dish, I, I don't know if anyone has actually gone to the kitchen and come back for the fifth whiskey. But um, a dish that contains, you know, tomato, mozzarella, basil, things like that, a nice burrata with a, with a nice long slice of focaccia bread, you know, th this is what we're doing at the vault, so that's, that's what's in my head just now. Um, but a nice savoury, but not overpoweringly savoury. Um, it's, it's like a creamy, sort of almost fruity, savoury dish. So I'm, I'm talking about the tomatoes here in, in particular. Um, but very nice with a cheese board. You could even go as far to say it's a lovely seafood whiskey. You could, a nice sort of whiskey cured salmon with cucumber relish and a little sourdough biscuit to, to complement that. Um, but this is just talking about the nose. I mean, I haven't even tried it yet, and I'm getting all of these incredible layers coming out of the 10.204. Um, so, uh, yeah, Pineapples Ahoy, a lovely, fantastic name, very descriptive. Um, one of the smaller Isla distilleries, I think you've, you're talking about four stills there, um, and they're both, uh, or all four of them are pear slash onion shaped. Um, and when you're talking about the shape of the still, uh, you're looking at the, the, the inherent character of the whiskey. So if you think about a pear, let's, let's stick with a pear shape of still. It's a very simple style of, um, of still. It's a very simple shape. Uh, there's not many little grooves or um, nooks and crannies that the whiskey can get caught in. Um, to to create reflux, which is where the heavier flavor compounds stick to the wa walls of the still and then go back down to be redistilled into something a bit lighter. So these pear and onion shaped stills don't have that. They have very little reflux, if any at all. Um, so all of these flavor compounds come rushing out of the cast, uh, out of the still, excuse me, and go uh, straight to bottling essentially. 
So you're getting all of these very complex layered flavors, uh, long chain fatty acids, like a, a, something that gives a whiskey a real body. Um, and it's something that I would, I mean, it's totally down to everybody who's tasting it, but I think it's one that would um, certainly benefit from a little dash of water because you're getting a lot of intense flavors, especially for the last whiskey. Um, from Isla, you're looking at very, very um, complex, heavy flavors. Um, but there's only one way to find out. So, no, that's that's surprisingly smooth. But I think you're still getting a really warm kick out of this. Um, so a little bit of water might just take the edge off, and you're getting more of the tropical fruits if you add a little a little dash of water. Um, but as with uh, many Isla whiskies, and it took me a long time to get into Islas coming from Speyside and having been told all of my life that, um, or you know, people who were drinking whiskey with, it would either be Speyside or Isla. And it's a very, it's, it's, it's a tough one to judge. Um, but there is no judging it at the end of the day. It's, it's all about what time of day it is, who you're with, what you've had prior to the whiskey. Um, so you can't say Isla or Speyside is better. Um, but you can say that there's a certain time of day for Speyside and there's a certain time of day for Isla. And I think at the end of a tasting, a lovely, heavy Isla whiskey, oily and coastal with a nice tropical touch is a beautiful way to end um, a five dram tasting. So that is an absolute stonker. And that sounds bad, but stonker is a good thing in Speyside. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've had uh, one or two questions. So Suparno said he, he can't find it on the website. Um, I'm not sure if you mean the bottling or the article we were talking about. The article um, can be found on the Unfiltered website, and I think we have a link for that. Um, it's but if It's right up at the top. Um, but otherwise, I'll share it um, in the Facebook group um, for this event tomorrow. Um, this particular bottling was a part of the April outturn, so it's not available tonight um, as part of tonight's tasting unfortunately um but it is I, I think we can all agree a, a beautiful dram and the opportunity to get to to taste it and share it now um is is wonderful um i saw david as well saying he tried it with cheese um i actually went to the supermarket and they had no mozzarella which was what i'd suggested for this which was really annoying so i had to change it up last minute um and i went for a cracker with um, a mature cheddar and a peach and cardamom chutney. And I actually think that was better than the mozzarella would have been. So <laughs> chutney, That's cheese. Beautiful, absolutely yeah. beautiful. Going all out there, man. Yeah, yeah. The only problem was to put the chutney on at the start of the night. So the cracker has um, somewhat disintegrated. So I've, I've been uh, struggling to eat it. <laughs> Oh, no, that's, that is beautiful, though. I think a sweeter chutney with a bit of, um, you know, something plain on the bottom, a nice sort of oat cake or a cracker or something, mm. a nice sort of not too intensely salty cheese, but a nice sort of fatty cheese to complement that oily character, and then a bit of sweet chutney. Um, and the more the more um, I let this linger on the palate, the more I'm getting some of these, like, jammy sort of um, the apricot and marmalade jams sort of things. Um, mm. And lovely, lovely, sweet sort of fudge aftertaste. Um, I haven't had water yet. I, I can't quite bring myself to it, but I will I promise. Because it's all about experimentation. Um, it's just, it's it, it can be quite a, a daunting, sort of scary thing to add water to a whiskey that you're already enjoying. Um, but uh, just add a tiny, tiny little bit. It's much easier to add water than to take away. Uh, obviously, so you're um, you're talking about dashes, maybe even drops, um, and the worst thing that can happen is you know it, it it takes sort of the heat away. But I find that rarely happens, especially for such a whiskey um, with this viscosity. You know, you're just looking for those tropical flavors to open up with a little dash of water. So I think I'm just going to bite the bullet and just add a little dash, little dash. I think when you add water to this flavor profile in particular, um, it can bring out a lot of sweetness that you maybe experienced initially on the palate, but it kind of uncovers it a bit more. Um, and I found that this flavor profile in particular is really fun to play with, especially if you um, if you enjoy shellfish. It's quite a good one for 
for that. Um, just because of those sweeter aspects, you still get a bit of salinity, a bit of maritime, but you also get this, this really lovely sweetness that has layers that you can just sit there and uncover. And, you know, sometimes you'll get things like chocolate and think it's bonkers, but it totally works in the context of the dram. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some drams, and this is the beauty of um, working with so many different styles of whiskey is that sometimes you will get um, not an unpleasant note, but there's something that's a bit off uh, off par, like a bit um, sort of stranger. Uh, that, for example, somebody told me that um, the Isla that they were drinking was like the, uh, it was like a seagull's armpits, I believe they said. <laughs> Um, and first of all, I've got to question where they got that tasting note from. Um, very vivid imagination, I would say. Um, but you, you often see these with uh, the peated, the heavily peated, even some of the oily and coastals. You're getting some very, uh, we call them off flavors, but that doesn't mean to say that they're unpleasant. They're just something that you wouldn't attribute to a pleasant flavor, but it's something that works together with the rest of that whiskey in in the glass to make it you know a full experience of for example an isla whiskey or a campbelltown whiskey um that you just can't get in um certain parts but i'm not getting any of these off flavors in the oily and coastal and that's that's something that i've um rarely come across in an oily and coastal whiskey this is just really syrupy very tropical maybe the slightest hint of smoke, but maybe because I'm looking for it rather than I'm actually experiencing it. Um, it's something that you maybe come to expect from an Isla whiskey, for example, but um, very, very pleasant, lovely, oily whiskey. And again, just one of the most sort of viscous whiskies in the, in the lineup here that just coats the palate love, uh, beautifully and um, lasts. It's a, it's a taste that lasts and the finish, my God, I'm gonna feel that tomorrow. <laughs> and it's it's actually it's the dram that that um you all were most excited to try so i ask i always ask in our facebook event group which dram you're most excited to try for the tasting um and and this tasting it was actually all with five votes for pineapples ahoy um and then a couple of votes for the other ones but really this is the one that everyone wanted to try tonight so um it, it's good to see your your tasting notes um even if they aren't about uh, seagulls armpits which is also quite difficult to say <laughs> what have i done <laughs> what have no, you I'm done seeing, no i'm seeing a comment from ian mcintosh and that's an abs that's a very good point um i don't think i noticed the smokiness until i added the water i think initially it was just very syrupy very tropical uh, you're getting the fruitiness um but then a little dash of water and it just sort of bursts with this smokiness so I'm glad I wasn't the only one that was getting smoke out of this last dram, but it was only until after I tried it with um, with water. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Uh, so, so Paro, it's Andrew, it's Andrew Reed. I, I, I've got nothing to do with seagulls' armpits. <laughs> <laughs> and the two, two Andrews mixed up there. I just want to separate myself from that one. <laughs> no, no, I'll take so, that. So. <laughs> Andrew, that smokiness, where do you think that's came from? Do you think it came from the fact that the cask is a refill and potentially the former spirit was part of that? Or a um, little bit peat in the mash bill, do you think? I would say it, it might be down to the mash bill. I mean, there's one of those things that... Um, there, so one of the uh, big conversations in the whiskey industry just now is whether or not the the source water carries all of these minerals and these potential flavor compounds through the, the fermentation stage and the distillation stage into the final spirit. Um, and it's very hard to say. I would say it probably doesn't. Um, so you're talking about the peat that is used to dry the barley. Um, and I would say that even though Buna have an, oh, excuse me, um, a, a certain Isla distillery, a certain Isla distillery does not normally peat most of their spirit. Um, but it's um, it's one of those things that probably carries through no matter how little um, peat that they use. 
because the the composition of peat that they use on Isla is is such a different composition to other styles of peat, for example, in the regions of Speyside or Highlands. Um, on Isla, the peat is much more heavily laden with uh, wood material. And wood material, when you're talking about the decomposition um, of peat or the composition of peat, um, the wood material will attract much more fungal activity. Um, and that doesn't sound very pleasant, but it, it helps so much in uh, in terms of isla style because the fungal activity is what gives you the the fennels and the guayacols and the really intense not just smoky but medicinal flavors um so if you're using even the slightest amount of isla peat it's probably going to carry through into the final spirit because it's such an intense flavor that this smoke is imparting right at the start of the production process yeah. Um, so very, very interesting stuff, and it's not, It's something that you just can't recreate in other parts of Scotland or other parts of the world because um, of that that fungal degradation uh, just in the, in the peat. So we talk about the three big um, ingredients that go into the making of Scotch single malt whiskey, which is, of course, water, barley, and yeast. But then peat has such a large part to play um, I suppose we don't talk about it as much because some distilleries use it, some distilleries don't. Um, but it, the, just the smallest amount will make such a big impact. So maybe they've used a little bit of peat at this distillery. Um, and if they have, then it's come through and only with a drop of water. And I find that just absolutely fascinating. And that's, that's why I love this job and I love this company. It's just an incredible thing to discover um, while you're sitting here uh, with four beautiful drams, uh, five, excuse me, five beautiful drams in front of you, and this one just changes fundamentally every time you go back to it. So incredible, incredible stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It is. And um, there have been some really good comments coming in while um, we've been chatting about this, and one of them, I just, I really, I want to pick up on it. So Andy um, Dyack is saying, I don't think any of us ever stop learning. And if that means trying more whiskey, I'm okay with that. I would entirely agree. All three of us um, are on our own separate whiskey journeys, but even, you know, doing this job every day, there is so much that we're constantly learning. Um, there are whiskeys that we haven't tried. We haven't tried all, all the whiskeys that come out, um, but the ones you do try, you learn from them. And I think that's one of the amazing things about being a part of the society is, is finding your way. And, you know, maybe your the first flavor profile you ever fell in love with isn't the one you're in love with now. It will just continue to evolve. And we're all learning at all the time. And, and it, it wouldn't be fun if we weren't, quite frankly. Absolutely. The main there's two main takeaways from what we do is the amount of people that we meet on their own whiskey journey, whether being in the industry or yourselves, the members, we're always learning from each other or on little kind of interesting tidbits. And also the hardest part of the society is we don't work for these distilleries, you know, so we've got to focus on flavor, but also learn about the production process and where the nuances come from or where the spirit and why we've chosen this. So it's a difficult job as much as it is. And you won't believe us, it can be quite difficult. But yeah. <laughs> The main There's thing a is lot of information to take in. I think because we get yeah. such a large volume of members that are from totally different backgrounds, and you know, speaking from personal experience as part of a team um, that you know specifically based in the vaults, we have so many different people um, that come in, but that we're also working with that are from totally different backgrounds. So we're always learning from each other. Every time I walk through that main door in the vaults. Um, I'm, you know, I'm ready to just absorb more knowledge and then just leave uh, a little bit more knowledgeable. But it's always important to remember that there's always something to learn. And going back to my original point of, you know, whiskey is just a point of conversation, um, whether it's based in flavor or technology or, um, you know, terroir or just raw materials or anything like that. It's all just something that, I think as staff members, um, we're all just willing to learn and there's no 
you, you can't just learn it yourself. You have to, um, you know, interact with these uh, people from totally different backgrounds. Um, and that's why uh, this this whiskey society is just, you know, the, the best thing that could come from um, <laughs> somebody uh, on the side just getting a little cask of whiskey, giving it to his friends, and it's just branched out from there. And it's an incredible thing. And I will, uh, I'm always amazed at how humble uh, our founder Pitt Hills is. Whenever he comes in, um, everybody's coming up to him, like totally uh, fan clubbing Pitt Hills and getting pictures. He just doesn't understand um, what impact he has made on the whiskey industry. Um, but, you know, just to say a very small thing that has happened from the society is that we're getting to try whiskies from distilleries that normally make, go into making uh, blended whiskies. So we're getting like a base character from something that you would normally never get to try. Um, but uh, just an incredible thing that he started. Um, and we all hope to just sort of enhance that and bring that to more people and spread it around. Um, and I think this is an incredible way to do that is to highlight the individuality of each bottle that we, um, or each, each cask that we bottle, um, and further enhancing that by making cocktails. Um, even us at the vaults, we're starting to make an old fashioned and we're sort of tweaking it around a bit. We've started making a mint julep with a dash of lime because the lime needs to cut through. You know, we're talking about um, very simple flavors that just need brought to life. And um, it's all about the feedback as well. It's a, it's a very important thing to realize um, when you're talking about so many different flavors that come out of essentially the same ingredients. Um, we're always looking for feedback in what you taste and what you smell and what you experience um, on a on a sensory level. It's it's an incredible, incredible spirit. This, and I think you know everything we do is it, it's about you, our members. Um, and and with that being said, it'd be really good to hear what your highlights of the night were. Um, which which was your number one? So Andrew Andrew Park, I'm going to ask you what was your top dram for tonight. I I have to be a bit biased and go with the, the 35. I think that just hits that slightly elevated level than the 36 does. Just slightly. And it's just got a slightly. little bit of, it's got a little bit of me on that bottle, that's why. So I've got to be a little bit biased <laughs> on it. But it's it's a tough following. It would have been the 36 if it wasn't for that, I think. It was just a, a surprise. It's a surprise in the glass. I wasn't expecting that range of flavour from that. Personally, I'm not um, a huge fan of not a huge fan of the peak, unfortunately. Not tonight. It's a little bit too hot yeah. for that. But. And Andrew Reid, what did what, what was your favourite? Um, I've got to say the thirty six one six four was probably my favourite. Um, as soon as somebody mentions Christmas cake, that's a very that's a big uh, tick in in um, in my whiskey tasting. But this one for me is. Again, one of those um, underappreciated distilleries, not many people know about, you know, where it is and what style it is, but it's got this incredible, you know, it's, it's got the base uh, space side characteristics, but it gives mm -hmm. you this really nice warm spice and this chocolatey kick um, that, you know, that I would say is very similar in distilleries number one and number 41, same, same kind of cluster. Um, but this one has got a lovely honey sweetness um, on the back. I think the name says it all. It is a really, it's it's an absolute treat. Um, lovely, lovely stuff. And it's, you know, to say that the, these middle whiskies are all part of the same flavor profile and they give you totally different experiences. It must be very hard to, you know, combine all of these whiskies into 12 different flavor profiles. It's a really, really tough job, but I would totally agree with every single one of them. Sweet, fruity, and mellow, but each of them have different characteristics that set it aside from the other two. Um, but it's got to be 36 for me. I I was gonna say as well, I mean, for me, I think it's the 36 too. Um, although the 39, the very the very start, Apple Aperitif, um, was really great. And I, I saw that Ian, 
um, has done what I've done and gone back to it um, in between. And it really has changed and kind of become a lot sweeter, which I've, I've really enjoyed. Um, but I still think 36 is the um, standout dram for me tonight. Um, we've had a few questions coming in. We are actually out of time for the evening, but we will come back to um, to those questions. Um, I'll, I'll answer them via YouTube. So questions won't be forgotten. They will be answered. Um, but we've got a couple of housekeeping points um, and then we're going to um, raise a glass and, and call it there. Um, so I know one of the questions was about the UK virtual tasting when the next one is. So there is one at the end of July and the packs for that will be going on sale next week. So look out for that announcement. Um, next out turn is Friday the 2nd of July, so that's next Friday at 9 a.m. usual time, um, that's British summer time. And um, I guess most importantly, I want to say thank you to the two Andrews um, for a fantastic evening of sharing these drams. And I'd like to raise a glass to you both because it's been wonderful and a glass to all of our members who have tuned in tonight. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Matt, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Slanger. Thank you.